Salutation Shades, and welcome back to your one-stop shop for all things strange and unusual, talking with shadows. The conversation everyone has, but no one wants to admit to. Here with your returning host, I know y'all miss me, Vic Waitley. And Marcus D. And joining us in the studio today, we also have an awesome special guest. Please welcome Ellie Waitley. Oh my god. God, how do you guys keep conning me into doing this? <laughs> we got her into the episode. You know, you know you love coming on. We did. And well, well, well. Look who decided to start <laughs> crawling back into the studio. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. I've been damn near as sick as I have ever been. They don't even know what I had. It wasn't COVID. It wasn't pneumonia. It was something respiratory. But I, it, it screwed me up really, really bad. I'm not even entirely over it. Actually, yeah. Uh, uh, Vic, I don't know if you know, I actually got something in the, the mail from your doctor. They got your test results back, and it uh, turns out that you had a really severe case of the man flu. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, you were sick like a week longer than Oh, that. my God. Yeah, Ellie got sick at the same time, and I was sick for, I actually, I think it was a little over a week longer than you. But you gave this to me, so this is as much your fault as it is mine. I'm just finally happy that we can be back here on the studio recording, because let's Three episodes, I've been, like, banished to the office of my house, back to using a, a Yeti mic and uh, Google Meets to record <laughs> our stuff. Okay, guys, I did prepare a punishment for myself. For today, I am going to be drinking a $3 beer I randomly saw called Mississippi Mud. That is that is really big for $3. Uh, is... Yeah, that, my thought is a bottle this big for $3, it has to be bad. So I mean, maybe it'll surprise me and it's good, but I'm going to guess no, it's not going to be. That, that's a quart. That <laughs> that's is a, a quart, quart of beer for three dollars. <laughs> okay, what are you guys drinking today? I'm drinking Stone Tangerine Express IPA. It came in a box that said, "What was it? Tiki something? What, what was that? What was that box that oh, you I had?" I don't remember. But I, I grabbed it because I'm taking a vacation during this episode, guys. I'm relaxing. Vic's doing all the heavy lifting during this episode. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out, by the way, to the two special guests that that filled in since Vic's absence. We want to give a big shout out to uh, Frank Hessian and the Libertarian Guitarist who joined me for the last three episodes. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for picking up my slack. Mm -hmm. Where's the bottle opener? Ellie has it. Oh, never mind. I'll wait patiently. Mine just twists off. I I will. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Three. Quality beer. beer. Yes, that is the that is the way you can tell a good beer is it just has a, a twist off. Oh, there's this weird foam on top already. It doesn't even look like beer foam. Oh. I'm excited. Oh. Okay, cheers, guys. Cheers to the fans. Cheers. Sorry I've been cheers. gone. All right. Okay, oh. let's get the first taste of this. Mm. Okay, that is. Okay, it's not the worst beer I've ever had. I actually, like most beers, I do enjoy it. Oh, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, there's an aftertaste. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) What the heck? This might be, oh, my God, I might have found another beer I don't like. Okay, uh, you guys have to try this. What? No, I mean, there's this really weird after. Okay, when it first hits you, you think it's just going to be normal beer, and it's fine at first. But then give it a few seconds. Okay, she's drinking it. Now just give it a sec. Wait for it. Oh, you don't get uh, it? Yeah. I thought I thought it had this terrible mm. aftertaste. I'm gonna drink it. Okay, let let it sit. Let it sit. It kind of tastes like that sit sit. That's like grindy taste that you get yeah. like in like lake water, like in like yeah, lake it water. Yeah, tastes like lake water in beer. Well, ugh. Yeah, this is this is going to be punishing my body. They're just drinking just straight water from the Mississippi River like, at this I, point. I generally say there's only one beer I dislike, <laughs> and that was uh, oh god, some, some weird beer called Hennessy I ran into in the uh, Pocono Mountains. But this this is bad too. Mm. The Tangerine Express isn't too bad. It's like a summer tan. It's like a, it's like a it's like a pale ale. It's good. It's good. It's a citrusy pale ale. Yeah, you guys enjoy those nice mm. beers. Uh, you know that's not that's oh man that's tastes like relaxation that tastes that 
That is what I'm talking about. I'm going to drink right. this real fast so I can have, like, another beer <laughs> to like watch the taste out. Move on to the good beer. <laughs> I will I will give you guys updates as I begin to finish this. <laughs> like, go over comments while I chug down as much as I can. At some point, you're just going to drink a rock. <laughs> okay. All right, so in our, uh, if, you, if you didn't uh, catch our last two episodes, uh, the f- episode that I did with Frank Cashin, we covered the uh, disappearing object phenomenon, the really cool object uh, phenomenon where people will report like setting an object down, turning their back, and then going back, and it's gone. Uh, missing objects, objects that randomly appear in their house. Really, really strange stuff like that. So, all right, Nighthawk says... I think 99% of cases are just a combination of human memory being terrible at accurately remembering things and our brains going on autopilot when doing routine things like driving and eating. If you do something that's a little out of routine, it's not enough to snap your brain out of autopilot, but it will do something wacky like put a box of cereal in the fridge. Then, of course, then you go to look for the cereal in the pantry. It won't be there. Uh, That last 1% is probably someone's... Grandpa pranking them from the afterlife. <laughs> I like that. I like that, but my my thought is the last one percent is objects clipping through the ground, <laughs> just just falling into the development space. What is is your idea of the world? You know, created by Bethesda. <laughs> that does sound like a Bethesda thing. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, theory of Falcon says I have this happen a lot. I usually blame it on my brownie, a fairy. Funny enough, if I ask them to give it back, it usually gets put back. Usually. This is not the first time I've actually heard of that. Mm-hmm. I know I bring that up in the uh, I bring that up in the uh, the episode where I talk about uh, the when I was living with our, our friend Charles. Yeah, and yeah, Jesse, it, yeah. Whenever uh, whenever someone would go missing, he would he would always say that it was brownies. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, why are you guys bringing brownies to my house? And I didn't get one. And then they finally had to explain what brownies actually were. So if you check out that whole episode, you actually get the really cool, the, the whole in-depth story that I go over to it. Then. Also a really appropriate thing to bring up considering what we're going to be talking about today. Yes. Uh, I'm checking over on uh, the patron side. Uh, Dan Ward said, this is pretty much a daily occurrence for me. If I'm at home, I might set something down within two feet of me and look away for a second, and then it's just gone. So does that mean you have kind of a wonky memory or you're sworn by brownies? What? <laughs> you just have an infestation of brownies. I, I'm in leaning your house. towards brownie swarm. I think I don't remember what we uh, said in the episode. My my recommendation is try baptizing them. It seems to piss them off and drive them away. <laughs> I mean, I lose things all the time, but I just know that because I'm a absent minded person when I'm doing something, and I'm almost always in the middle of doing something. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's jump over to the nuclear, uh, the missing nuclear scientist episode that I did with the awesome libertarian guitarists. Uh, that was a really cool episode where we talked about this strange phenomenon where uh, nuclear scientists around the world are either missing or dying under mysterious causes. I'm sorry, guys, you keep hearing that clanking. It's just this bottle of Mississippi mud is freaking huge. It's going to make it drunk. Every time I set it down, it makes it squirt. You're probably just going to be, by the end of this episode, just, like, totally wasting on that, just going, oh, man, I can't do the hoot thing with the jug. (laughs) You need to drink it first. It needs to be an empty bottle. But okay. I've had too much beer. I'm sorry. Jay the Phoenix said, uh, you guys are on my watch list for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, Gold Soul Radio said, good podcast, guys. I had no idea how many people go missing in the nuclear field. Pretty sketchy, to say the least. Yeah, I did too. I thought that was really weird, like how many uh, s- nuclear scientists from India had like just disappeared within the last 10 years. It is just a staggering number. And you would think that that would be something that would be uh, publicized a whole lot more. And yeah, you think really missing not. nuclear scientists would potentially yeah. make news? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm checking over on the, the patron side. Dan Ward said, I'm feeling spoiled. Two episodes in as many days. One which is probably the longest to date with a video edition of the Pillow Talk. And the second one that has an absolutely awesome intro and amazing guest star. Absolutely. Uh, if you ever check that episode out, we actually have uh, the libertarian guitarist. He does a guitar rift in the beginning of the episode, and it's always awesome. Always awesome. Yeah. All right, let's uh let's dive into today's episode, man. Let's let's go ahead and just dive right in. What do you guys think? Oh yeah, I'm ready. So today we're talking about the good folk. The good folk. That's right. The, the best other crowd. Folk. That's right. The Indianapolis cults. Well, I was singing the sheep. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. The <laughs> I'm sorry. I got mis. I'm sorry. I, I was mis- I misunderstood. Sorry, what we were talking. No, we I misunderstood on research. That I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, we're talking about fairies today, and for research, I read the book The Other Crowd. And considering that we're kind of going with the theme of talking about fae in association with disappearances, I picked poorly. Although I do recommend, if you're wanting to learn a lot of interesting stories about fairy lore, The Other Crowd is great. It is on Audible, and it's really quite good, but does not talk a whole lot about disappearances in association mm. with fae. I, you know, it's 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 interesting because so many of them we were talking about uh, disappearances all throughout the the month so far. Very little uh, for a lot of people did, did the concept of Fay come up at least at first, and I thought that was rather interesting because there there actually is a lot of reports and accounts of people either disappearing or almost disappearing due to the good folk. Yeah, well, the face subject nowadays is considered to be quite esoteric. It's not something that, like, even if you're talking paranormal fields, if you're talking to someone who legitimately believes that Faye might be out there, they're usually an outlier. I'm one of them. There's a lot of Faye stuff still going on, mm -hmm. like uh, the tragedies that happen to people who build over, like, fairy forts and burrows and stuff. Yeah. Like, I think there's something to it all. But it's not something that's brought up a lot. Like, if you go to watch a paranormal show on, like, I think the History Channel, the Travel Channel, it's not something you're going to hear no, about. No, it's not. Like, when me and uh, uh, Frank Hushin were talking about objects disappearing, and we watched that, we, both of us watched this lecture uh, from Dr. Jinx, and he was talking about explanations for all of them. Like, he was really doing it in a very scientific way, and I was really waiting for somebody from the crowd to stand up and go, what about all the people that say fairies are the cause of stuff going, and him just going, <laughs> Yeah, but those guys are nuts. <laughs> Doing like the John Goodman from King Kong. <laughs> Just say that. Like, it's hard for some people to take this here. And it's 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 really weird because, you know, th there's a real strong culture of some people that hold on really strong to the, to the belief of how, you know, you can go missing if you're not careful with dealing with them. Or your stuff can go missing, too. Oh, yeah, disappearances is heavily associated in Fae lore. And there's a lot of things associated with Fae that go on nowadays. That we just don't talk about in that context, like mm -hmm. being pixie led. Um, a lot of people, if you're suddenly missing for one thing, we'll talk about being in a familiar place and suddenly being entirely lost. Like being in a mile of woods and suddenly not being able to find your way out. This is a classic example of being pixie led. It's where a fae has influenced your mind to be unfamiliar in what should be normally familiar surroundings. Just one more reason for me not to go in the woods. Oh, there's lots of good reasons to go in the woods. Go in the woods. No. No, if I go if I go into the woods, then I might accidentally, in some way, shape, or form, offend a fairy, or it might just get me and just be like, you know, I'm gonna do this guy looks like a good mark. This guy looks like this is a guy that well, can easily trick. You look like a good mark. Hey, 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 hey! First of all, I believe that, and that's why I'm joking. Okay, that's why I don't go in the woods. I think he'll just die because he's an indoor person. I am a very indoor. <laughs> I am like an indoor cat. <laughs> I'm walked outside. I'm like, there's grass. I don't know what to do with this. I can't. The bark touched me. <laughs> For, like, years, like, Vic has been trying to convince me, like, you know, like, with the stuff with the missing 4 and one and David Pilates talked about people going disappearing, like, way deep in the woods. He's like, he's like, yeah, we should, we should go, like, way out in the woods. And I'm like, haven't there been, like, several stories of people just getting led astray by, like, fairies in the woods? Oh, yeah, tons. And I take these actually fairly serious. Like, last time we were out investigating something paranormal in the woods... <laughs> I actually carry a uh, sack of coins, like nice shiny coins with me. Because if you find yourself pixie led, one of the common ways to get out of it is to look for a burrow and toss a few shiny coins in as an offering to be let, let loose. All right. Now, hang on. Back, back, back that up. 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 <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm as back as I'm going to go. All right. So what's a burrow? Like, for those of us that don't know, like, what are you talking about, like, if you see a burrow? Like, what's a burrow exactly? Generally, like, a mound, usually with a hole in it, like, where a fox or a uh, hare might go through. It can also mean a larger mound. And when I say, like, a fairy fort, that can also mean, like, any place where there's old foundations, old stones, where once a stone circle had been, things like that. Okay. And then you just carry around just a sack of coins. If I am doing something paranormal in the woods, I don't take risks. I bring survival gear. And I bring, like, stuff to get me out of paranormal situations, too. So if on the off chance that fairies are real and they can make me pixie lead, I'm going to try to throw some coins at a burrow because that's how the stories say to get out of that situation. Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. So does the kind of coins matter? Like, can I just carry, like, 15 cents worth of pennies? They or... just need to be shiny. 
Okay, so they can't be like old, like dirty, like pennies from like just, under my car. Full, just shine full them up. Shine them up before you try it. You know what's funny? I actually read some uh, Appalachian stories about using uh, candies wrapped in those like shiny foils to do the same thing. Oh yeah, like this sort of lore has persisted <laughs> throughout like throughout like history. This is the sort of thing that keeps popping up and up. Okay, so okay, so you're in the woods and you see a burrow. Two things that you might be able to use is you can give them money or you can throw them candy. It sounds like it needs to be shiny candy. Though. This sounds like a mugging. That's what, that's yes. what that okay. sounds like. We, it is like a mugging, and I think we've actually had this conversation before. I don't think we've had it to this extent. It's the they're, We call them the good people, not because they're actually necessarily so good. It's more to placate them so they don't do bad things to us. I just feel like now we're being held hostage now. <laughs> like we're like going into the woods. Kind of. Man. But the thing is, uh, does the okay. kind of wait? Does the kind of candy matter? I don't know. They, the account I read just talked about it had to be shiny wrappers. I'm guessing it was like old people butterscotches or something. Yeah, so like where, not. where there's a, you know what they're getting if I go in the woods, pennies and where there's originals. That's what you get. But when it comes down to it, what these stories really are are stories of people being affected, lost in a way that they should that shouldn't be possible. And this is a means of getting out. I'm not saying there's definitely fairies out there with butterfly wings and all that jazz. But what I'm saying is a lot of people have survived by using this technique. So I'm going to use it. (laughs) If it's going to help me live, I'm going to do it. It's the same way I'm going to bring extra batteries just in case the batteries in my flashlight goes out. I'm also going to be bringing coins just in case of fairies. Like I... You, it would really surprise people, like how how many other people, like really strongly, like do believe, like still, like how much of a, a belief this is that, that fairies are still out there, and this is a thing that can happen to you. Like I remember when we were when I was looking up stories and stuff. How many times I was watching YouTube videos of like really old Irish grandmas with a cigarette going, "Yeah, I told them not to be going out there in the woods without chasing all their maps. They were gonna get like the pixies got them. Like, oh yeah, your grandpa got got taken back in 1962 whenever he's out in the woods, like wandering around chasing them rabbits." Oh yeah, like the book I read, the uh, other the other crowd, it's all about these old stories that from people who legitimately believe them telling their family stories mm-hmm. of people in their family who've had encounters with they, and it had a lot of very interesting tales that I was unaware of. Mm-hmm. Across cultures, did you guys find that there were s- similarities to being pixie led, or did you guys see any, di- or did you guys see any differences amongst that? Like the way people get uh, pixie led, I would say it's at least consistent in parts of Asia, Europe, and North America. At least in parts, I can't speak for every tribe and every group, but I have noted that there are similarities at least in those two. And I want to say there are stories in Australia as well of be of uh, these mischievous uh, things out in the wild being able to make you disoriented. So I would say that should count as well. Because one of the, some of the ones that I that I that I saw a lot that seemed like you know like we, we talked a little bit about like how some of them can just be you in the woods and this happened. But I heard I, I read several stories about especially women that were talking about that they would hear a familiar voice that something that they like a, like a, either a person that they recognized or a person that was like calling to them in the woods. Which is always a creepy <laughs> as hell thing. There, okay, I don't know if these are fake, but there's definitely something out in the woods that can mimic people's voice, and I don't recommend following it. Maybe it's fake, maybe it's not, but whatever it is, don't go to it. <laughs> I've read too many stories of people having this. Yeah, like I, uh, so many stories. Like I, I, I was just so surprised that somebody was like, "Oh, that doesn't really make sense." Why I'm hearing like you know, my family randomly calling me the woods when my house is over there. <laughs> like, okay. I noticed this. I want to see if any of you guys picked up on it. Have mm-hmm. you picked up on any uh, threads if you want to have an encounter with one of these, what to do? Because I was able to spot one definite consistency between a whole lot of stories. Um, I think if, uh, for me it was messing with their house. Like if you know where they live, I would like type the types of places that they live, whether it's like, you know, berry bushes or mounds of rocks or earth mounds or whatever. That's definitely saying they can get you in trouble and potentially killed if you look at okay. Yeah. In Ireland a lot there's been several times where people have um, paved over ferry mounds and things like that to make new roadways. And they don't do that anymore there, and they also don't do it in Iceland either. Um but one of the things back when they were doing it is there were a lot of people involved with the project suddenly dying in mysterious ways. 
in a strangely high occurrence. So I think there might be something to it. Mm -hmm. But what I was thinking of is walking alone in the woods at night. That seems to be a very big magnet for this sort of situation. Well, I think that's a magnet for paranormal experiences in general. I know <laughs> it kind of makes me want to go for a walk in the woods alone at night. Like, Do you think I still have a camera? Like, I think if you're looking for something, I think that just makes you seem like a mark by wandering through the woods alone at night. You're like, oh, yeah, this guy's asking for it right here. Well, if you're going to try to catch a predator, you have to be able to seem like prey. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm surprised. That, I, don't, I know what you should do instead. If you're just, you, I'm going to add a couple steps to this. You go walking through the woods at night with handfuls of shiny coins and candy stuck to you. Uh, what do you think, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that'll get them? I think that might get um, some social workers called on you. <laughs> Something, another thing, okay, I came across one story about um, someone being, and I came out with a few, but I found one that had an abnormally high amount of detail, right. where a man gets, uh, he discovers a fairy mansion out in the wilderness. He ends up uh, going inside, he's offered food, gold, and all these things, and at first, there, he's giving a lot of gold, and he's about to start to eat as well. And as he goes to eat, he hears a voice from one of the fairy's servants there, who's like, don't, don't do it, don't do it, don't eat it. <laughs> and after they get the uh, the Fae away from them, she explains that she was her mother's sister who was stolen by the Fae. And since no one ever warned her not to eat uh, the food, she got captured. And she wasn't ever allowed to leave. So she passed the story on to him and told him to just run and go. Uh, when the Fae came back, he just kept refusing the food, trying to be polite. And eventually the Fae just flips because his goal in giving him the gold was to lure him into eating the food. And he doesn't want to give up his gold for nothing. So when he flips out, all the beautiful things around in the mansion fade away. And the servants there turn into these gaunt, skeleton-like creatures and basically go after him. He tries to flee from them, but he ends up uh, passing out. But when he awakes, he's okay in the morning. He just ends up basically running himself to exhaustion. The things never actually try to get him, but what he did still have was the gold. Which I thought was an interesting part to it. Well, it it seems a lot of times when... Because initially when we were looking at this topic, we were looking at the topic of strange disappearances, right? Like fey yeah. disappearances. But when you really research this topic, what you find more often is typically people that have encounters with fey, but they get away. Well, the people who disappear you know, don't yeah, come back uh, yeah, to yeah. the story. So it, so it seems like what those stories are are, are stories that in which people... Uh, successfully navigated their experiences. So assuming they're the ones that, that where they disappear. But one of the things that I, that I that seemed like that was a common thing that was told if you run into Faye is always be polite yeah, and never make deals. But it seems like there's so many stories about not eating their food. Doesn't that seem rude to like not accept something that they're trying to offer you? I think it probably is, but that's, I think it's, okay. As I understand it, and I think Ellie can probably help us out with this is that when you eat their food, that's taking something from their world into you, and that allows them to extract a degree of ownership over you. I mean, it does kind of play into the whole contract thing. Yeah, I, I that's how I've heard it explained. Um, another reason, okay, I found another odd link to why they steal people and why sometimes they don't come back. In a lot of Irish tales, it's because they need referees. <laughs> apparently they they play very aggressive games of hurling which is a traditional irish sport and they'll commonly just kidnap people off the road at night to referee the hurling games which they'll get violent if you say no and they'll also get violent if you decide they lose so almost all these stories where the people come <laughs> back are stories where the person had to either find a way to call the game amicably or force the game to be a tie <laughs> so a lot of those stories were just people trying to <laughs> make it as amicable of a passing so they get out without dying but I don't think I have a feeling that's not what the disappearances are it, the disappearances like say here in North America there are certain aspects that smack of Fay, but I don't think it's going to ref their hurling games I think that you have to sift out the folk knowledge 
and try to find the consistent kernels of truth in it. But I don't know. What do you think? I For the, the people that seem to get kidnapped, is there a pattern or no? Uh, walking alone at night, I know, is one of them. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Uh, beautiful people, people who rest near fairy barrows, rest near fairy forts. So basically hills, old ruins, um, uh, musicians, um, people who linger too long near fairy circles, those circle of mushrooms you see in the woods. I mean, it sounds like what it is is it's in one of two ways. You're either A, offending them, or B, there's some sort of particular trait that they find it that they find value in. Oh, and don't forget if you can see them. Oh, that's true. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. That's assuming they don't just tear out your eyes, because yeah. that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't like people like, knowing our business, so we're going to rip out your eyes. Yeah, there's a story of a, a girl who spots a, a fae person, and he says, oh, you can see me. With what eye can you see me? And she says, what do you mean? He says, cover up one of your eyes. And she covers up, up her right eye, and he disappears. He goes, oh, so you see me with that eye, and he gouges out her eye. Okay, I'm taking some notes here. Don't wander through the woods I kind of forgot about that one. <laughs> Mind my own fur business. Uh, just keep walking. Okay. Oh, yeah. If you see a fae, it might be best to pretend like you didn't. I mean, it just sounds like when you're dealing with fae, it like, sounds like similar stuff when, like, when you live like in like really urban areas. I'm like, did you hear that? No. <laughs> I'm like, did you, nah, I didn't see nothing. Did you see something? No, nah, I didn't see nothing, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's a common thing in a lot of supernatural stuff, actually. <laughs> if- yeah. You notice it, it starts to notice you. So you, yeah. you you don't see nothing, you just continue on your business, and you'll probably be safe, maybe. But they can be nice, too. They can do you favors, they can do good things for you, especially if you've previously done nice things for them. They're more than happy to pay it back. It just sounds like Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> like if I'm just, that just sounds like an abuse. If I do nice things for me, they won't, they, won't, they won't kidnap me. That just sounds like just extortion. Let me ask you guys something that I've been mulling over for a while. When you examine these missing person reports here in the USA, one of the commonalities is locations near berry fields or right. the person was picking right. berries and stuff. Right. Assuming perhaps, follow me down the rabbit hole for a moment. If there are these creatures that mythology has deemed fae mm-hmm. and they have this association with not being able to eat their food, perhaps the food that when these stories were being created that we're talking about were not necessarily like prepared food like we're thinking about. It's more the food that's in their territory. If these things exist here and they live out in the wilderness, which most stories tell us that's where you find them, what if people are wandering into their area and picking the berries and eating them, and then they're laying claim to them? What do you guys think about that as a possibility? I mean, I, nobody likes somebody rummaging through their fridge. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I definitely think that there's something... I definitely think there's something to... Fairies claiming areas as their own. I mean, because almost all the stories involve a degree of territoriality. Yeah, well, it might not even be... It might not even be um, that... It, it might not even be that it's just the food that they eat. It, it could just be something as trivial, trivial as, that's mine. Like, it's just, like, they don't even eat it, but it's just mine. Like, they don't want yeah. your stuff removed. Like, there's a national park that's in Arizona, I want to say, and it's very common for people to take some of the petrified wood that's there and then get cursed supposedly by the fae that live there. And, and they don't remove the curse until they literally send the wood back and write an apology letter. Like the national oh, wow. park, it's the national park itself has hundreds and hundreds of apology letters from people sending uh, their bark back and apologizing for taking and saying their lives were destroyed. <laughs> bad things befell them from tanking it. Isn't there a, <clears throat> Isn't there a place in uh, Hawaii that has that too? Oh, I believe if that. If they take uh, the volcanic stones from that area, their lives are just ruined. It's not. That's not a story I'm personally familiar with, but that sounds like something I might have heard before. I don't know, Marks. Have you heard of it? Uh, the one from um, the one from Hawaii it doesn't ring a it doesn't ring a bell to me, but it's not. It, but it doesn't surprise me. That like there's a lot of things like with fairies like they they claim particular areas as their own and if you mess with it that that, that they're gonna come after you and curse. You. And that sounds exactly like saying they do. <laughs> but 
I do sometimes wonder if this could be an aspect of... I, I'm not... Once again, I'm not saying specifically every aspect of fairy lore is right on. It's just the folktales that have been handed down to us. What I would say is I think these folktales are describing the existence of an entity that is out there. Is it exactly like their stories say? No, there's probably a degree of folk fiction worked into it. But if you find commonalities in the story, which you can when you're looking through those face stories... And then you apply those to, say, missing person cases, uh, you can find connections. I'm not saying that's definitely mm. what it is. The missing 411 situation is incredibly hard to solve. But I am willing to say that this could po be a possibility. I would 100% believe that, too. I, I mean, I think that there's, there, there's definitely something going on in which people in some way, shape, or form seem to be running afoul of something that they may or may not understand, and then and then that's when they end up having an, an experience like that. Marcus, do you think the listeners can let me off the hook for this Mississippi mud? I would stop drinking it just for oh, your health. I think, it's, I think it's killing me. I think I've, I drank half of it, and oh my god, it's just so bad, guys. <laughs> he tapped I, out is, through half a beer. It, he it's tapped a out beer. through how, half how, a how beer. Is this beer. It's a quart. This is a quart, so I drink a half quart of this. Oh, can someone give me a bottle cap, or I need a, I need a real beer over here. I think I gave it back. Oh, no, I got it. Hoard in the bottle cap popper. Sorry. So your now punishment. I'm to admit that I didn't actually drink any of it when you gave it to me. <laughs> you just put it on your lips. That was it. Yeah. Mm. Oh, man, that's so much better. That is so much better. Mm. Drink that Mississippi mud will make you appreciate all other beers. All right. Well, Stone Brewery, congratulations. You are better than Mississippi mud. <laughs> uh, do you think that they're... Okay. Do you think that there is a connection to the rise in disappearances and national forests with people, more people, I would say, like in North America that seem to be not knowing some of these rules when it comes to encountering faith? Well, yes, but in two ways. The first thing I'm going to say is these stories, to a degree, are cautionary tales telling you to stay out of the wilderness. <laughs> so there's that part. But also, I think that it could be that if you follow these rules, you might be able to work your way out of the situation on your own. Because I think there's a possibility that these rules might actually keep you safe because it might be the same sort of entity taking it, or at least something that works on similar rules. Mm -hmm. I think it was really interesting when, you know, you talk about, like, some of these cautionary tales, but some, like, some of these, like, like, grains of wisdom and things that people should remember – how we seem to pass that down without even necessarily knowing why. It's like that moment whenever we ran into that burrow whenever we were down in uh, Mammoth Cave National Park. Yep. And you were telling me. Yeah, that, have we already told the listeners this story? I think we I think we may have told it in the pillow talk. But you were talking oh. about it earlier. You were talking about that yeah. moment that we ran into that. Why, why don't you tell the story just in case we haven't told it? Yeah, so we were we were going down to Mammoth Cave National Park. We were inve we were investigating um we were investigating one of the churches down there, Mammoth Cave Baptist Church. On the way back from the church, this was during the day, we're driving by. I'm driving, uh, Vic's in the passenger seat, and uh, Ricky Brockman from Mountain Vernon Paranormal is in the back seat. And Ricky, off the corner of his eye, said, what's that? And and I immediately stop, of course, because we're in the middle of investigation. And I pull up. We are middle of nowhere, no GPS signal anywhere. My phone has absolutely no service. And we were driving a good 25 miles an hour. I mean, it was hard to spot. Ricky said he noticed what he thought was an altar off the side of the road, like not too far off into the woods. Now, where we were, this is not something, there's no trails, there's nobody that's yeah, hiking this. it's just this. the middle of a, a big Yeah, forest. yeah, we're literally just in the middle of like a driving path where we're going. So we get out and we walk up there and we find, we find like the corner of kind of like a foundation, like a race part. It's maybe two feet off, no, nah, three feet off the ground. And, and there's I, no kidding, you guys, a freaking flower offering sitting on there. Yeah. Clearly, this was intentionally laid there. Yeah. And, like, freshly cut. Yeah. You know, this... And the flower wasn't wilted or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, this is... This was very early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we decided, too, that we're going to fan out and kind of search the area. So, me and Vic eventually wander our way to... Um, back... Kind of like like through some brush, and eventually we come upon a burrow. Like we come upon a burrow with a hole in it, and it was really really freaky. 
And then we just politely back away. Yeah, I'm like, okay, there's an altar with flowers on it, and there is a straight back from there, something that looks like how a Fay Burrow is described. Yeah. So I'm like, probably best if we do not linger here. Yeah. And when we, were, yeah, when we were leaving, you were talking to me that this is something that a lot of people, that was a park rangers or people that will tell people when they're in training, is that you'll see these, don't mess with them, I don't know why. My trainer just told me, don't mess with them. Oh, at least according to that yeah. one report they came. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, people will be told, don't mess with certain things like that, but they don't know why they're but being told that. In a lot of times when people are being pixie-led or missing 411 counts where people come back, there is a there is a tendency for people to notice something like that, like a burrow with a hole in it, or to mm -hmm. have messed with something like that right before they were suddenly mm -hmm. lost in an already familiar area. So I'd say it's one of those things where if I run into one of those in the wilderness, I'm not going to screw around with it. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to be polite. But I'm not going to linger lo longer than I need to. Mm -hmm. You see stuff like with kids, too. I, there was a real very – there was there was a weird tense story that I, that I was listening to where it was talking about two kids. I want to say it was a, it was a boy and a girl, and they were cousins. And they they get they go into the woods and they find a berry patch and they start just a berry bush and they start eating the berries, and then all of a sudden they start hearing like the sound of music and the sound of like just merriment like off in the, this field, and they go over to the field and when they're in the field they see some like just short fairy folk just like in a circle dancing around and one of them in like this sort of like green dress short walks up and hits the girl in the face with some sort of shrubbery and brush. That's what they describe it as. And then she, like, as they're, like, running away, she, like, keels over. He says dead. And he, whenever they, whenever he gets her home, their dad runs and go get, goes against their pastor. And their pastor, like, does, like, a prayer over her and, like, does, like, essentially, like, to call her spirit back, they said. And they said that if they hadn't, like, done it in time, that the fate would have, like, stolen her spirit, which I thought was probably one of the most intense stories that I that I had heard involving, like a, like, a pastor or something like that. It one of the things that I can pick out of there is it sounds like it was a fairy thistle. Mm -hmm. It's these thistles that, if pricked by, it can cause all sorts of nasty side effects. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that might have been what the fairy had hit her with, or perhaps going further back in the lore, there's something called fairy shot. Are you familiar with fairy shot? I think I had that at a bar in uh, in Vegas one time. Nope, try again. <laughs> uh, no, it's, um, it's basically these projectile, they're normally a projectile weapon, but it's something that a fairy can shoot at you that can cause sickness, plague, or even weirder things like leave like yarn buried inside your skin or things like that. It, it can do some weird stuff. It's some of the older fairy lore, mm -hmm. but it, it sounds a little more like a fairy thistle, though. I'm just waiting for the next Tinkerbell uh, story to come out. And then she's like, yeah, it's like, they didn't believe. Then I pulled out my gun. <laughs> like now I got to worry about them like shooting me now. Uh, yeah, actually that's been a thing for a really long time. So explain to me exactly how this is not a mugging. <laughs> like, like I it's just not a mugging because they wouldn't like it. If we called it a mugging. that's, I just, I feel it's you give them what they want and you pray. They they pray they don't make it worse for you. Like, should we move? Like, I feel like we just live in a bad neighborhood like that What if we're running like, into When was them? the last time you saw a fairy around where you live? I don't think they live in the cities. Okay. Unless, like, some of Holly Black's books are true. Like, I, I, like, I feel like this is just, like, fairies are just way more, like, just straight gangster than we just give them credit for. I mean, they got, they got some class. They got an old school class to them. I mean, in most of the stories, they come off as being very intriguing characters. Um, okay. One of my favorite stories that I read in prep for this was one involving two priests. Uh, two priests were called out to give last rites to a old man. This occurred in I in Ireland. It was I can't remember the specific woods, but they're passing through the woods and on their way, they hear a haunting music. They said it was like no music that they had ever heard played before, and they started to suspect that there might be something wrong. Then a man steps out from uh, from the woods, and it's a very tight, dense wood, so they can't really get around him. He steps out, and he has his fiddle and his bow, and he asks them to stop. They're immediately put on guard because, well, there's this weird guy stopping them in the middle of the woods. And he explains, I know you're on your way to see a dying man. If you want me to let you pass, you must do me a favor. 
And they kind of hesitantly agreed to do this favor for him. And he said, what will happen to the good folk on the day of judgment? And they said, okay, we will ask the dying man that. And he steps aside and lets him go. He gets there, he performs the last rites, and he has to do the version of the last rites where the person can't speak back to them because they're too sick. And afterwards, he basically, after the guy had passed, he asked the question. And the man sits up and tells him, um, if a single drop of blood is found within the good folk, they will see the face of God. So the guys return from doing the last rites, and they encounter this man again. And they very hesitantly tell him what the answer was. And the guy becomes furiously angry, cuts his hand and shows that no blood comes out and says, if any humans are found in our forest again, it will be the, it will be the, uh, the last time you'll ever see them. And basically says, if we're not going to get into heaven, then we will reclaim the forest from you. And I thought that that was very interesting. First you have, this isn't the only time you see a discussion about fairies and heaven or the good folk questioning what happens to them after death. But this is also a declaration of why they're taking back the woods, <laughs> why they make people disappear in the woods. And I thought that whole thing was very fascinating, something for us to maybe mull over. Mm. Well, I think when it's a, I mean, with how important fairies are to a lot of cultures, I mean, it's not surprising to me that like that, is a question that gets asked of the Catholic Church because it's something that, they, I mean, it's not like it's just fairies that they've had to, you know, ponder the thoughts of. They've had to deal with, you know, vampires, mermaids, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, all, all, other sorts, all other sorts of things. Yes, yes. Can a mermaid accept Holy Communion? You know. <laughs> Which is something the Vatican has discussed as well as you do know. fairies go to heaven. It's interesting to come across these documents where priests are having these very interesting discussions. Mm. It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's it's not it's it's definitely an example to me. I think when two cultures are trying to intertwine and they're trying to make sense and they're trying to make sense of each other, and then they're they're trying to make it's two cultures coming in conflict and and then and then intertwining together. But beyond even just that part, do you think that this could be assuming that they are real uh, that they also exist in the United States, as American Indian legends would imply. Right. And assuming that these are the same sort of entities that the priests encountered in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Could this be part of the reason? I don't think it's any... I, I don't think this is any... People were disappearing in the woods before that. I, I That's don't... That's true. I, I don't think... If I... I mean, I, I don't think... I don't think there's any... I don't think there's any changes to that. I don't think... I don't think the narrative of the story changes. I think what that is, is it's a bridge between the two narratives. Between the two, between the two, between the two cultures. Yeah, but eh, I'll give it to you. But with many of the the pre or prior fairy stories, there was a better chance of returning. And nowadays, we're dealing with people just straight disappearing. But I would I say, mean, yeah, you're probably right. No, I'm, yeah, I think that there's stories of people that are. There, I, I, I mean, I was listening to some where people were were accounting their stories of running and of running into fairies and stuff too. I mean, it could. I mean, you could also do the same thing for like for modernization too, like because I mean, like you know, you have s cities literally just expanding out and just cutting yeah. down trees. You run into you run into similar kind of uh, stories involving like like the rainforest and national parks down in South America too, where people are going missing. Yeah, and another reason why I often connect missing four one one and the Fae mm -hmm. is. The Fae have always had this association of living underground in these burrows and how the map lines up so well with cave systems. Mm -hmm. But also, I think there's other things that could be attributed to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think missing forward one is a it's a huge thing. I don't Which think it's probably gonna does not one. have a singular explanation. No, well. no, but I but I think but I think definitely with the I think with the lack of people realizing of like of how to handle themselves in the situation, like that could be an example of why some people are going disappearing in the woods because you know. Uh, with the national park system, it's creating a, a space for people to, literally to go to to explore the wilderness. Okay, we're coming up on time. I want to pitch out a question to you two. Sure. Fairies, real, not. With like a minute left. <laughs> With like a minute left. I, I'm going to say I don't know if they're real or not, 
but I'm still going to uh, make my little people doll for the garden. Mm. I I think that fairies are their own way that some cultures explain their interactions with the paranormal. So uh, do I think that they're real? I think people have, I think the paranormal is real. I think paranormal experiences are where people have, they run into things that, that can't be explained. I think the fairy tales are an attempt to describe real interactions with creatures beyond our understanding. Maybe they're not specifically their own thing. Maybe this was them encountering ghosts or cryptids, mm -hmm. and then them they labeling it fae, and a lot of the right. folktale stuff was added on. Or maybe not. Maybe the folktales were accurate, and there's also this entity in the paranormal as well. Either way, I think they were describing something, and I think it's worthwhile to listen to these stories yeah. and use what knowledge you can glean from them. Yeah, uh, dude. So if you guys like this episode... Like, let us know. Uh, leave you know, leave us a like if you like the episode. Listening to us on YouTube, always subscribe. Hit the notification bell so that way that you can stay up to date whenever we put out a new episode. If you're listening somewhere where you can uh, review the episode, leave us a review. It always definitely helps us. Uh, put in the comments below. Have you had an interaction with a fae? Have you heard stories of people going missing because of fae? Are there interaction? Are there rules with fae that we didn't talk about in this episode that people should remember? Uh, put those in the comments below so we can talk about them in the beginning of the next episode. Um, but thanks you guys so much for listening to this episode. We really appreciate it. But until next time, guys, keep believing. Because we'll keep listening. All right, guys, we're going to slide into the Pillow Talk segment of this podcast. If you want to check out the rest of this awesome podcast, all you got to do is go over to our Patreon and sign up for as little as a dollar a month to get the rest of this awesome podcast, as well as access to bonus episodes that we put up on our podcast. Just like the last one, uh, I put up uh, an actual video recording of the entire Pillow Talk segment. Uh, it was like 40 minutes long where me and Frank Hessian uh, talked about the missing stars phenomenon. Uh, which was really cool. So if you want to check out some of those bonus episodes, all you got to do is go over and do that. And just for as little as $2 a more a month, you get to vote on the poll for the theme for next month. And currently right now, the winner of the theme so far is Hairy Humanoids. Ooh. That's looking like what might be uh, September's theme, uh, as well as Ghost Towns is right behind it. So do you want to tell them about what you've convinced me to do? Yes, I have finally convinced uh, Vic... Uh, to finally do uh, spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> oh, I, I, that's not what I said. Okay. Okay. But also, in exchange, we got to do squid people, too. Oh, it's squid people. That's no, right. No, I was talking about the other thing. The, the buying the third mic? No. What, what am I forgetting? The Discord. What? Oh, that's right. Yeah, we were talking about that in the break between these two sermons. Yeah. So we have been talking about for a while. There's been a call for us to get a Discord. And we have finally decided that we are going to actually create a Discord. So whenever that goes up, we will make an announcement. So that way that you guys can join us on Discord to ask us questions, to interact with us a little bit more. So more details to be coming out on that very soon. All right. So now we're in the pillow talk. What do you guys really want to get into for today for the pillow talk segment? I don't know. You said you had a topic for yeah. us. Okay. So... When when you look at like the stories of people going missing and people running afoul of fate, like wouldn't wouldn't you think like with globalization and how cities seem to be expanding that we would be encroaching more and more upon like fairy domains, like and things like that? So shouldn't we be seeing some more just bizarre phenomenon? I mean, I would say yes, we are pushing into their territory. I just don't think they have the capability to stop us. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about most of the fairy lore. Much of it involves they kind of got their ass kicked by humans and retreated away from us. Mm -hmm. So do you guys think that it's just like they're just on the decline? Or do you think that maybe there might be something where some figures are more adapting to living in the city? Or we're seeing possibly more of a rise of urban uh, paranormal phenomena involving faith. Things are changing. Well, I mean, the uh, homes in Argentina don't seem to be having a problem. <laughs>